evening, everybody. Can you hear? <laughs> Welcome uh, on this Monday night in October, when, as usual, you must have lots of competing engagements. But thank you for dedicating your time to us. My name is Shamila de Gonzaga. I'm a co founder of Ivo Comentales and executive director of World Council of Peoples for the United Nations. And we are so happy to be presenting tonight's event, which features the screening of Sanctuary, as you can see, and what promises to be a very informative, enlightening, and thought-provoking discussion, as we are very uh, lucky to have both the film's director, Andrea Cordova, and Deputy Commissioner Sonia Lin from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, who's dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So really, information from the source, um, I couldn't be happier to have them and you here. Um, we're going to go straight into the film after my colleague Pilar from Sudena Tropical gives a little bit more background on the documentary. Uh, a note from Elisa, who is standing there filming the discussion uh, after the film, as there will be this conversation, and you will be a very important part of it, we ask that you please, please wait until the mic is handed to you. I'll make another reminder, but um, we've had some issues in the past. We want your input to be recorded for posterity. So if you wait for the mic, uh, we'll be able to include your voice in that conversation. Um, goodbye for now. I'll see you in a little bit. And if you like, please, let's hear some background on the sanctuary. Thank you, Shamina, and thank you, everyone, for joining us for our second installment of In Documentales this semester. Um, just building off of what Shamina said, my name is Pilar Garrett. I'm the Assistant Director of Cinema Tropical, one of the uh, co-presenting partners of the Documentales series. So a little bit about the documentary. Um, just, just to repeat, but we're very pleased to be screening at the airport of us. Uh, critically acclaimed and latest film, Sanctuary. And we're very pleased to have her here with us today. Um, she's a Mexican filmmaker based here in New York City. And Sanctuary is uh, both her directorial debut and also won Best Film and Best Documentary at this year's Brooklyn Film Festival, which is very exciting. Uh, Andrea, uh, based here in New York for the past six years, she has been uh, exploring her medium as a visual storyteller in relation to immigrant and Latinx voices and experiences which you can see, of course, come together in uh, her debut, Sanctuary. Um, she recently received her MFA in social documentary film from the School of Visual Arts, and she will tell us more about her process and her experience making this film um, and any other questions that we all have for her after the screening. So thank you all so much, and enjoy. Congratulations again. I think the applause uh, spoke for itself. Uh, is it on? Yeah. Uh, we've already mentioned briefly who our two panelists are, but uh, I think they, they deserve a more full introduction so we can get a little bit more of an idea of their background. Um, Andrea Cordova is a Mexican documentary filmmaker, as was mentioned earlier, you're based in New York. Um, you've been working as a visual storyteller, exploring the medium in relation to immigrant and Latinx voices. And this is your directorial debut feature, correct? Um, and it has premiered at the Brooklyn Film Festival. You've worked as a researcher, as an archival coordinator, and as an associate producer and co-producer on different documentary features. And you studied here at NYU and at SVA, so you have a strong New York credentials. Uh, Sonia Lin is the Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs right here in New York City. Um, Sonia's efforts include providing equal access to the resources available in New York City for immigrant communities and connecting them with important information and services to enhance their economic, civic, and social integration into New York City. She has played key roles in the launch of major programs such as IDNYC and Action NYC in the Nationwide Cities for Action Coalition, as well as in local policies and legislation supporting immigrant rights and immigrant integration. And we're so delighted to have you with us 
Um, I'd actually like to, to start with you because the film is uh, it's centered here in New York City. So we see reference, we hear references to New York City policy, but here we have a representative uh, in person. Can you please educate us a little bit as to what New York City policies are um, as regards sanctuary and how are you dealing with this uh, debate or antagonism with federal policy on this issue? Um, if you could grab this mic. Yes. Thank you so much, um, Shamina, and thank you so much for that really powerful and beautiful um, film. I feel still very emotional. I think um, uh, being a you know city official, <laughs> um, I think we, we work a lot with facts and figures and um, and um, you know with our communities. But I think the specificity here and the sort of the whole range of um, humanity is really. I don't know how many people in the audience are still sort of choked up. Um, but to put my um, city bureaucrat hat back on <laughs> um, and to speak a little bit about um, the context here in New York City, I mean, I think taking a step back, right? Um, um, well, a few steps back. Um, you know, we live in a country um, where um, we in local government, um, you know, we are charged with a really profound responsibility to support. Um, the health, the safety, the general welfare of our residents. Um, and I think our approach in New York City for decades um, across political parties, um, I think there's broad consensus here, is that um, we can't do that without serving all of our residents, seeing all of our residents as New Yorkers, and recognizing that the health of our city, the vibrancy of our city is really um, uh, dependent on how closely we work with our communities, um, the empowerment of our communities, the confidence in our communities that they can um, come and interact with us in local government to get the services that they need um, to provide um, you know, information about crime, um, you know, to engage with local officials and local agencies um, for the sort of well-being of all of our communities. Um, and seeing um, from our perspective the um, uh, immense importance of um, figuring out how to do that in a city that's as diverse, um, enormous, um, you know, as New York City, uh, where we have 200 languages spoken here, 40% um, of our population that's foreign born. Um, if you have our population and um, sort of that's foreign born and the children of immigrants and immigrants, that's 60% of our um, New York City, um, um, our, you know, our, our, our city. <laughs> Um, and so how do we do that, right? It's not, um, and I think what I really appreciated about this film is that it really shows all the complexity um, that's involved with, with you know, protecting this one family, mm -hmm. right? And then as, as a city, how do we do that to celebrate um, and lean into the diversity of the city, but also recognize um, that um, there's immense, immense vulnerability um, in our immigrant communities as well, um, approximately half a million um, New Yorkers who are undocumented, um, and about one million New Yorkers who live in a household with somebody who's undocumented. Um, and so um, there's a lot of um, uh, recognition that we can do a lot at the local government level, um, and we can certainly advocate with our partners um, to change the broken immigration system, but the immigration system is federal, um, and, um, um, and so balancing that and recognizing that and working within that reality is, is something that um, has become even more of an acute um, responsibility for us in the last couple of years. So it's sort of, a, I guess, a very big picture. I'm happy to speak more about our specific approach, but you know, I think that's, that's where we're coming from. Um, I, um, I think it would be helpful because we get into some technicalities yeah. here, and I know uh, this question has come up in other contexts. So if one has to say, well, what, what is New York City's policy on sanctuary? What does it mean to be a sanctuary city? How do you define that yeah. in, in specific terms? Yeah, I think that's a really challenging question. I don't actually have a simple answer for that. Um, and I hopefully we have the space to really discuss Please. that this evening. Because, you know, I think, um, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I have a legal role. So my first instinct is to say, well, that's not, you know, it's not a a legal term, it's not a term where there's a commonly accepted definition. 
Um, and I think it, in a way it's almost a little limiting um, for us in the city government because it doesn't capture the full range of values and history and sort of action that we could take. Um, I think where, and so, you know, I think, um, you know, as a city um, that I think many people are very proud to call it a sanctuary city, well, what does that mean? From a city government perspective, um, that means um, we've taken the approach of putting into place um, policies that um, sort of are as protective as we can make them um, for, um, for all of our residents. Um, recognizing again that the immigration system is federal um, and that federal immigration of course which happens in our communities every day um, and people are arrested every day, right? And that's not something that we can fully control as a city. But what we can control is that we will keep people's information private and confidential to the full extent of our ability under the law, um, that we will not cooperate with immigration enforcement except in limited circumstances having to do with public safety, um, that we will invest in um, immigration legal services programs so that immigrants who need um, legal help um, can access safe, free, um, easily accessible, culturally competent um, legal services, um, that we will make sure our city agencies um, uh, have the best practices available to them, um, both in terms of protection um, for, and, uh, for services and resources, as well as language access so that people can get the help that they need in their language. <coughs> and that we will invest in outreach, community education, community empowerment, rights information, so that our community members know their rights, know how they can protect themselves and their families at this very, very scary time. We do none of this information on our own um, in city government. It's, it's with the partnership of community members, community groups, um, you know, amazing groups like New Sanctuary um, who are really out there in the communities every day. Thank you for, for explaining that it's not a legal term and that we are, in, in effect, um, existing in a gray area. <coughs> um, maybe Andrea, as uh, the director of this film, um, uh, how much did you know about these policies of accountability when you began to, to document um, Amanda's story, and kind of, could you share a little bit about your journey accompanying her throughout that year, basically, that she's living in the church? Uh, yeah, of course. So I didn't know a lot about the like sanctuary and um, the specific immigration policies in New York City. I was working, this was my uh, thesis <coughs> film in my uh, master's, and it uh, I had to come up with a, with a topic uh, right around uh, when Donald Trump got elected. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I need to find an immigration story, especially since I'm from Mexico and uh, I always uh, like to engage with a Latino immigrant story. So I, uh, I knew, I heard about the new Sanctuary Coalition, so I reached out to them uh, first. I met with uh, Father Juan Carlos Ruiz, and he's just an incredible human being, and I like sat down with him, told him like, I'm not really sure what I, um, want to do yet, but I know it's it's about immigration in New York City and the work you're doing is incredible, so I just like follow you around for a couple of weeks and, and see what comes up. And so I, I spent a lot of time with, with the new sanctuary at the beginning, I think I was with them uh, for a month before Amanda even took sanctuary, so uh, I got to know the organization and I volunteered at their legal clinic here at NYU, and so I got to learn a lot of the policies and kind of like the grassroots movement and activism that was happening in, in the city. And I found it very fascinating to uh, realize how many, uh, because Trump had just gone into office, how many people were actually like reaching out and, and, and asking what I can, what can I do to like help what's going on. And so it, it was like a, the, the organization was really getting a lot of attention and a lot of uh, volunteers. So I was interested in that. and. Um, but had to find like specific story to follow. So um, Juan Carlos told me, there's this woman, she's gonna take sanctuary, you should film her. And uh, so I went there the first day that she went into the church and it was kind of very hectic. There was a lot of, of uh, media there. Um, and it was interesting because Juan Carlos like invited me and I had already spent some time. So I was kind of like part of the new sanctuary, like they knew me and they introduced me to Amanda. So she was uh, more um, like at ease with me. 
Uh, but it was interesting to see all of the, the media that also the New Sanctuary invited because it was such an important and relevant case. She was making a public announcement. Um, and it was very overwhelming for Amanda and also for myself to just see how um, how everyone was just like taking their pictures and like asking her these like super intense questions like, so how does it feel to leave your home? And how long are you gonna be here for? And she's like, I have no idea. So I uh, spoke to her that day, but just uh, a little bit because it was clearly very overwhelming for her. And then the next morning I came back and explained what I wanted to do and I wanted to follow her story. And uh, from that day forward, I uh, visited her regularly. I waited two months to uh, do a sit down interview with her. I didn't want to like, like impose like my questions on her when she was like dealing with this. And I think it was a, a very interesting collaboration between the two of us. And I actually uh, asked her to uh, write a diary, to keep a diary of, of her experience. And that a lot of the voiceover is her reading entries. Thank you. It, it's interesting. You're touching on something that's come up several times in documentalist programs where you have stories that are centered on individuals. So through the film, we're experiencing a very human story, and yet people are being catapulted into a political space mm -hmm. where they're no longer almost allowed to exist as regular people. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be somehow acting and speaking and thinking on behalf of questions that are so big and that involve so many factors beyond anyone's control. Um, to give a, a little further context before we open up to uh, input from all of our participants here, do we have any knowledge of how many people are in? I mean, you mentioned that 37 people took sanctuary in 2017. I'm wondering, even just uh, orders for deportation in New York City right now for undocumented people, do we have an idea about how many people are uh, right now in a similar situation as, uh, as Amanda's? I don't have a current number. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a number either. I think, um, I mean, what we know is that, um, you know, since um, this president took office, and I think the, the film discusses this, right? The um, arrest rate has skyrocketed nationally. Um, we know that in New York City in particular, um, arrests have gone up something like 88% from the last year of the Obama administration. Um, and I think this was also discussed in the film, um, the arrests of people without criminal convictions um, is sort of, the, the rate has gone up in an even more um, astounding way, something like 400%. Um, and so um, what we are seeing is that people who have lived in the United States 5, 10, 15, 20 years right, with deep community ties um, who don't pose any threat um, to public safety um, are being caught up in um, this sort of enforcement dragnet. Um, and it may be people with old orders of deportation, which are civil, orders of deportation like Amanda, um, or people who have never uh, kind of been um, in immigration proceedings who are, um, are being caught in this really intense, overbroad um, enforcement uh, environment. I just wanted to add that I think something that was interesting uh, while filming with Amanda is the idea that everyone was um, kind of telling her, if you go public, it will make a difference. If you go public and people will hear your story, like there's gonna be enough pressure that the government is gonna do something to help your case. And as you can see in the film, and as Amanda like, came, like she expected she was gonna be there for two weeks. And it, it was an entire year of her life that she spent inside of a church. And so I think what kind of has shifted is that perception that media attention actually like helps. The immigrants, have, there's a lot of sanctuary cases that just don't go public because it's more dangerous to the, to the people that are uh, missing their lives. Thank you for adding that. I think that's, um, that's also a very important point when you're in an activist space. This, um, this hope or optimism might not always be well-founded. I think the, um, the priest, uh, Luis Barrios, mentions, oh, you know, for churches, you're scared yeah. you might lose your, your status. And yes, for a good reason. Right? Um, and he takes us into that whole dimension of legality and morality, and where do we draw the line. Um, 
with that, because I know there's always a great deal of expertise and experience in the room, I'd like to invite all of you to, um, to share your input or questions. Uh, if you could raise your hands, and um, as was mentioned earlier, wait for the mic so that we can make sure we, we have your voice uh, as part of this discussion. Anybody like to start? Uh, Thank you. That, of course, was a very moving, more than moving film. A uh, question to the legal sense, and it may not be directly related to what happened to Amanda now, but if her children were older and she maintained this status, and her child, one child would reach, was it 18 or 21, would they be able to sponsor a mother who already had a deportation, let's say, attachment to her, history, would they be able to really sponsor her to become legal? Thank you for that question. I think that um, it really depends on each family's circumstance. Um, I think, as you noted, um, the, the primary hurdle for somebody who's undocumented, who has a child who's 21, who's a US citizen, that child could file a petition um, for their parent. Um, to adjust their status and become a green card holder. Um, but the big stumbling block is the old order of deportation um, and the challenge for um, the family and for um, you know, the legal representative supporting the family would be opening up that old deportation case and vacating the order um, in some way. Um, and if you got a little bit of a flavor, it was really captured nicely in the film of just the Byzantine complexity of immigration law. Um, you know, I think uh, people, uh, judges liken it to the tax code, and it's just tremendous complexity. And so imagine, you know, um, you know being a, a family who may not, English may not be your primary language, it may not be a language that you are very strong in, um, navigating the system, um, navigating a set of laws in an unfamiliar country um, that you know, don't necessarily correspond to a sense of, of fairness or your, your reality at all, um, and, and trying to do that. And so I think um, it's it's a very, I think, uh, not unusual uh, circumstance to be facing. Clarifying. Uh, anybody else? No? The bad? Yes. This is a question to Andrea, but I'm wondering where Amanda is today. Um, so it's a very like uh, uh, like we don't like I don't like to discuss about it because it puts her at, at very high risk. And you're uh, being filmed. Just to yeah. So, but uh, she her case got denied. Your what? Her case got denied. Denied. Oh, we can take um, a few. I see the gentleman here. So congratulations, Tonya. Uh, I just want to <clears throat> ask a question about uh, as a filmmaker, how do you go about a story that you don't know the ending? Uh, is there a script or there's no script, and uh, how do you deal with that? I just kept showing up and filming a lot of hours, uh, and uh, yeah, I wasn't. I was. Uh, I always had the idea that it could be very open-ended because Amanda had spent so so long in the church um, that even if she stayed inside, it could be like she's still there, she's still kind of like going through this. Um, she was in prison, basically, in the church, so I, I would have ended it like that if she had decided to leave. Uh, but yeah, I just filmed a lot and kind of at the end did everything in the edit. Hi, it's just, just a quick comment. Uh, really thank you for, for this film, it's beautiful. And I think you really captured the, the contradiction in Sanctuary and the tension because it, it tends to be a kind of a, when we think of the word, it's a beautiful word. And when we think of, oh, New York City is a sanctuary city, you know, we must be safe here. I mean, everything's gonna be fine. And I think you really captured the, the tension of, of being, of feeling trapped, you know, like you're in a community that, that loves you. You're in a space that is welcoming you, but at the same time, 
you feel trapped and this and, and I say this because I've been working with the New Sanctuary Movement also for two years and I I've learned a lot from Juan Carlos and from Luis and from Tara, from Amanda too. And um and also, I think the film captures the power of community. I think if we get uh, if we get stuck with the law or or what can law uh, you know allows us to do, what is the next step? We're never gonna succeed because the law is racist and the law is unjust and it's it and it's made to be that way. So I think uh, the the film also also captures that 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 the, that surplus is really with with community and not with the law side. So thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, Andrea. Thank you for such a beautiful um, and moving um, film and story that obviously deserves to be told and told over and over again. So to that point, I mean, it's wonderful that it's reached this audience, but not that you're not that it's necessarily preaching to the choir. But I think many of us here are probably cognizant of, of the unjust policies of this administration, specifically in regards to um, immigration. So to that point. Are you um, um, having? Uh, do you have plans to perhaps take it to, uh, you know, the um, evangelical churches, for example, and other Christian denominations that, for the most part, stand behind and support this administration and their policies? I mean, this film certainly touched on the the, the um, subject of the fact that it's. Yes, it is the law, but it is immoral and unjust. So I'm wondering if you have plans to, to do that, to reach a broader audience that's not necessarily so open and like-minded. Actually, that's a very interesting question. I hadn't thought about uh, splitting it like other churches that do not support the like, sanctuary movement. Uh, right now, I'm looking for specific places where I can screen the film, like uh, uh, schools or churches, um, sanctuary churches. Uh, but I'm not pursuing like a lot of um, other options because of the case, it's very, um, um, like it, it would put Amanda at great risk if I like went out and screened this film everywhere. So I'm very, being like kind of selective for the moment where, where I, I show it. Well, to that point, I mean, you're, you're raising a question that is fundamental to any initiative like this, which is how does one reach across to those who are tempted to dismiss all of this? I mean, you know, moving story put aside, um, and who aren't convinced by that notion that legality might have to be, um, you know, put in perspective of morality and other considerations. Does anybody here have any experience or thoughts or strategies and advice to our guests and participants for communicating with those who would be tempted to say, well, she broke the law, right? Twice, or I don't know. Because that's typically the a, a comment that one would hear screening this in an audience that is not um, favorable. Anybody? Sorry, I, have, I guess two thoughts. I guess one thought is a little bit um, that I think that there is still tremendous value and power in screening this film for folks who may feel sympathetic to begin with, who feel a lot of sympathy or interest and are compelled to come. Because I think, um, you know, I think we all, and I'm very guilty of this, get caught up in the headlines and the outrage of the day, and I'm just feeling generally um, sort of powerless. And I think the specificity of the film and the sort of humanity of it is, um, you know, I, I, for myself, again, I felt like it was very invigorating um, and it was a really important reminder. So, um, you know, I think, um, I think there's tremendous value to that. Um, and then I, I guess, again, with like my sort of policy maker hat, I think what we found in our space in the Office of Immigrant Affairs and, and in our engagement with a, a really diverse set of stakeholders on issues related to <coughs> immigrant rights and immigrants, um, which, you know, I think we've seen has become one of the most um, kind of toxic issues of, of the day, is that there's actually a lot of common ground to be had once you, like, take it um, down to, like, a sort of more human and practical level, right? And so, um, you know, as I started with, I think 
that we can really reach a lot of people by talking about our shared interest in safe communities, our shared interest in healthy families, our shared interest in um, uh, you know a sort of thriving local economies. Right? It was I think meaningful to know you know Amanda was working in the factory. She had this incredible sort of cohort of coworkers. Right? She was um, you know she was a participant in her community, and I think there is actually a lot of common ground to be found there. Um, and um, and it, it depoliticizes the issue, um, I think, and, 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 and people are able to agree that there's value. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Burning question, comment? Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Uh, well, to re-politicize the issue, since I have you here, um, and in the documentary, there's a sort of uh, indictment of the city uh, in, uh, in the sense of the police and how the police um, are arresting protesters, arresting leaders of the sanctuary movement. Um, and so you've spoken to the way that the city government um, provides services, but I was hoping you could speak, you could all speak to that part of it, how the police, um, maybe they don't always cooperate with ICE, but they do do things that end up serving ICE's interests. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think, I mean, it was, I think that was a really um, um, difficult day for many people um, in the community, I know. Um, I could say a couple things, not to speak for the police department, because I'm not all for Department. Um, but, um, you know, I think when I talked about the city's policies on non cooperation that extends to the police department, um, right, and I think we've seen good leadership um, from the police commissioner, um, you know, from, um, you know, from the entire um, department of um, recognizing that um, it does not serve the city's public safety <coughs> interests to conduct immigration enforcement um, and that there needs to be um, really clear policy and protocol um, for when there are um, circumstances um, such as what we saw in the film, right, where there might be a public safety issue um, and um, therefore it may be appropriate for local law enforcement to get involved. But that, since um, the day that Revy was arrested, um, there's been clarity around um, the NYPD's own protocols so that decision gets made at the highest levels. Um, and, um, and so it's, you know, it, the question is not, do we cooperate with ICE? The question is whether um, the police department should be involved if there is some kind of safety situation on the ground where there is somebody may be at risk or, um, um, right, you know, that, that it would be appropriate for local law enforcement to get in and that decision gets elevated. Um, and so, you know, there's the training. I think that's something that I think we want to continue to remain in dialogue with the community about. Um, again, I'm not in the police department, um, in the immigrant affairs, um, but we um, we want to hear about those concerns um, and um, to continue to work with partners in the community um, as well as our colleagues in the police department um, to make sure that um, people continue to feel safe. I'm really interested in your opinions of these, all of these questions. Um, in this case, as you said, Amanda had the permit to work. She was paying taxes, and she was selected to be in that positive state. So what happened to her? Why was she then, her situation was determined to be reneged, and why she, that was her a random case? that ICE is working under Trump's presidency. They have changed their priorities. Before, Amanda was never a priority. She had three US, and US citizen children. Uh, she had been here for so long that she, once she 
like in 2012 she got uh, into a car accident and that's how like um, the government like found her again after she was ordered deported and in 2012 they told her it was under the Obama administration she was definitely not a priority and so they gave her like they allowed her to stay and that's what they call the check-in so a lot of immigrants uh, that are in the like the U.S. know where they are, and they just have to come into the federal building and check in every, it depends, like she started and she had to come every two weeks, and then with time they told her you can come every six months, and then it was once a year, and then under trans presidency, after regular check-in, they told her, uh, we'll actually no longer be here and you have to go back to Guatemala. And it's just arbitrary because like the, the policies have changed. What is the status of her husband? Undocumented. Uh, yes, this is, a, of course, thank you for, for all the discussion in this uh, beautiful movie. Uh, there are, of course, many dimensions and components, and one dimension I'd like to, uh, uh, to see if you could uh, uh, bring is the dimension of the kids, because there's the dimension, the, there's the decision of, uh, of the mother uh, to go for sanctuary, uh, but you can see the impact on the kids. and. Uh, how is the government looking into this? And you can see <clears throat> different, um, uh, I would say, uh, emotional <clears throat> and also, sorry, and also physical, uh, because there's the development of the kids and uh, uh, the psychomotricity of them, and, and, and you can see that's impact because they're confined as well. Can you can you please uh, explore this a little bit? Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna say that it was very important for me to uh, get the children's perspective into the into the movie because it's such an under like uh, looked topic. There's millions of American citizen children that leave their homes in the morning not knowing if their parents are gonna be there when they come back from school, and it's such a, like it's an entire generations of kids that are growing up with tremendous trauma, and like not a lot of people. Uh, talk about it, and I think the government has not been doing anything to deal with that uh, reality. Uh, yeah, I thank you. I think that it's a really important point, and to really think about the mental health of children um, and their their wellness. Um, you know, I think I can speak to a few like <coughs> programs, but I think that is something that we all want to focus on more, um, and um, and recognizing right that um, these are families, right, and um, these are. There are um, there are children sort of collectively. Um, I think that there are a few things. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work with the school system, with the Department of Education, which I know is very committed to ensuring that um, immigrant families all feel safe um, in New York City schools. To put out um, information, rights information, resources, and to connect families to the resources that they need, and so. Um, I think we've seen really great partnership with the, the Department of Education, the Community Schools Program, um, to be able to connect families to legal services, um, to connect them to social services um, um, as needed in partnership with um, you know, the incredible uh, nonprofit service sector here in New York City. Um, there's also a lot of work that um, we've done to make sure that families know that schools are safe places um, and that um, they're not places where um, ICE can come in unless they have a judicial warrant um, that, again, these sort of, any sort of requests for entry go up to the highest level. They get reviewed by, you know, like extremely senior lawyers in the city um, to ensure that, um, you know, it's an absolute requirement. Um, and that in incidents where we have actually, you know, actually I think there's been sort of like, it has not been immigration enforcement at schools to enforce immigration law. Um, there was an incident in Washington Heights where there was a um, Homeland Security vehicle sort of parked near a school or right outside of school. And I think that the officers were getting lunch in the area, but it created tremendous fear um, and um, just intense anxiety um, and anger in the community to see this. And so I think you know a lot of our response has been focusing on getting good information out there, um, using our intergovernmental channels um, when we can to say, look, look, this is what's happening as a response, as a result of your actions. Um, is there more that we can do to focus on children's health and well-being? I think yes. 
Um, and I think that that's something that we continue to look into because this environment has been so toxic. Um, thus far, I think in my office, we've really approached it from a research perspective, right? It's sort of getting information out there about what this means, sharing good research um, that's been done, I think, by you know, tremendous researchers around the country about what this does to a whole generation of, of kids. Um, but I think there's also an exploration that we need to do about, well, how do we translate this into programming and action? Um, to that point, you've mentioned some of the ways in which the city is trying to be supportive, um, but it, it seems like the climate of fear and those messages have a much uh, bigger loudspeaker than all of these important efforts. Um, are there other resources that haven't been mentioned yet that people here should know about that they can take back to their organizations? Um, are, there, is, are there things that we can do very concretely? Um, this is to, to both of you to uh, provide people, not just with the information, but seems like there's a need for guidance because um, as you pointed out earlier, two years later, what has changed? So what are people supposed to do? Just keep the faith if they believe that this is the right approach? Um, is there a direction? You can start, I'm sure Andrea has some thoughts as well. Or um, you wanna start? I'm, like, I would just say, um, that everyone can do a, like something. I think the New Sanctuary is a great organization uh, to volunteer and at least to get to know what they what they're working for. And just in a more general general sense, just like knowing your neighbors and like just being there for your, like if you're a part of the community, knowing who they are and uh, trying to. Um, for example, um, Isabel, who was a, a member of the Washington Heights community, she was a member of the church, and she just immediately connected with Amanda and. Honestly, that woman was like the thing that got Amanda through like all the hardest time because she was such an like loving and open and, and just an incredible support. So like I think like knowing who your neighbors are, acknowledging that there's undocumented people all around us, and like being kind is like something that everyone can do. And and yeah, knowing like the the local organizations and nonprofits that are working uh, around you. some incredible organizations and community groups and institutions um, that are supporting immigrant families right now. Um, and I think there's, um, I think we saw some of the incredible community response um, earlier this year, this summer, right, with the threat of raids um, and, um, and sort of where New York City in particular was targeted as well as areas outside of um, the city. Um, and um, I think what we saw was just incredible effort to make sure that community members knew their rights, right? Knew that they didn't have to open their door to immigration enforcement unless there was a judicial warrant, right? That they didn't, they, they had the right to remain silent. Um, and I think there's tremendous community education and engagement, and I'm certain many people in the room were involved. Um, and um, and like we can keep doing that, right? From the city perspective, we want to keep investing in your rights programming and to support groups that are doing that and to make sure people are getting good information about their rights, because we all have rights regardless of our immigration status. The Constitution protects us all, um, and um, it's important for people to know that. Right, and that's something we almost have to remind ourselves of these yeah. days because it's uh, it's almost tempting to forget. Yeah, I and mean, we have to fight for them. Right, um, nobody will have them can't to take us. it for yeah. granted. Um, unless there are any other last inputs, I would invite you to, to make yourself known. Hold your peace until after we uh, exit this room and go to the reception. I think not. Sorry, so can I have a big round of applause?